try to. Good morning. Uh, let's just pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the opportunity to get together and worship with our brothers and sisters, Lord, and just pray that you just uh, be in our midst and pray that you find our worship honoring and acceptable to you. And uh, just bless our time together, in Jesus' name. Please stand with us as we uh, as we sing and sing loud. Yeah. Your love is amazing. back to the top. singing very much. He should. Yeah.
gift of praise is Jesus my
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship hour. Um, for an opening scripture, I'd like to read Psalm 100. So that is Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Four announcements. Um, Awana will resume on January 2nd. Um, there is uh, no Sunday school on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So that is the next two Sundays, no Sunday school. But there will be a Christmas Day service and a New Year's Day service, both starting at 11 o'clock. Um, Stan Friesen has been re-elected as assistant bishop for the conference. Um, if anyone is wanting to be baptized, uh, please contact one of the board members. There is a baptism service planned for January 15th. Um, we do have a new schedule for openings. Um, it hasn't changed a whole bunch from the last one, but... Uh, Please check your mailboxes, I believe they should be in there, and if not, please let someone know and we can we'll maybe put a stack on the back table. So that is starting for January 1st, there's the new schedule. Is there any announcements that need to be made from the floor? If not, we'll uh, call the ushers forward and take up this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, we... Uh, we come before you this morning and we thank you for providing for us. Father, we thank you for providing a place for us to gather. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we pray that as we open your word here this morning that you will open our hearts and our minds as to what you have to share. Father, we, uh, we pray for those who are dealing with illness, who are dealing with uh, with that, Lord, we pray that you would minister to them, that you would, that you would strengthen them. Father, as we take up this morning's offering, we, uh, we pray for those that are giving and those that are receiving. And Father, we uh, pray that this would be for your honor and glory, Lord. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. good morning. That's a good closing line on Christ the solid or rock I stand. That's good. All of the ground is sinking sand, so we, we uh, put our faith in Christ. He's the, the anchor. He's the solid foundation for all eternity, and it's good news. Um, good to be here this morning. 
I uh, want to open a, a scripture with you again and read scripture together and find out that Christ is our cornerstone, our solid rock again. And we want to uh, pledge our allegiance to Jesus, our Lord. Uh, and this is, this, is, uh, so this is interesting to me. I was, uh, a w- week ago I preached on what is the gospel, asking, asking the question, what is the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then, uh, so my mind went to our response to the gospel. If Christ is Lord, then what is our response? And the book of Romans chapter 10 says that we are supposed to believe with our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and then we will be saved. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. And I think we, we all understand the believe in your heart part. I think that's we've grown up. That's the gospel. How do you come to the Lord? You believe in your heart. But what's it is confess with your mouth, and you'll be saved. And I think with, with us Mennonites, we've been a little bit, well, believe in your heart, but keep your mouth shut. Is kind of the, the way Mennonites have, the way we've done things. Die Stille im Lande, we say. The quiet in the land, we let them see by the works we do that we believe in Jesus. But here it says, it says directly in, uh, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And so I've been, I've been wrestling with, okay, really, is it really that important that we say Jesus is Lord? Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Is it really that important that we say it out loud, or is it okay if we just believe it in our heart, right? So that, this, uh, that scripture has been a challenge to me this week. And so I want to uh, ask that question out loud and, and see uh, how scripture directs us here. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, God, for this good day. Thank you for Sundays, a day we set aside to remember your resurrection, uh, to remember that you've risen from the dead, you're seated on the throne, you rule over the heavens and the earth, and you are our Lord, and we, uh, we declare our allegiance to you. Thank you, God, for guiding us and directing us in life, for providing for us um, here about an anniversary, 57 years of marriage, your gift your goodness to us, the health and strength and life that you keep giving us, uh, the blessings that we live with, we are thankful to you from the bottom of our hearts. You have died on the cross for our sins. You have risen again to give us hope for everlasting life. We are blessed so much, and our hearts are filled with thanksgiving, and we want to honor you as you are worthy. I pray uh, that you would guide us as we read your word this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, I like that, Daddy, are you done yet? I remember when our kids were thinking the same thing. <laughs> uh, so this, this, uh, this thing about confessing with your mouth, what am I to do with that? So, um, and I, so I want to have an illustration here. And so you, you're, you're not supposed to, a uh, preacher's not supposed to get an illustration and build a sermon around it. You're supposed to get a sermon and find a good illustration. And so I don't know if you're going to believe me, but I had this sermon in mind. And I'm working on this question of what does it mean to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And then, um, I don't know if you heard, but on Thursday I got this this sermon illustration, which will be be kind of the the go-to. We're going to keep going back to the same illustration. I don't know if you heard the the queen passed away. Uh, So, yeah, you you heard that. Okay. Oh, you did hear that. Okay. Uh, It's kind of the big thing in the news, right? And uh, so she passed away at 1245, I understand, and which means at 1246, uh, King Charles III is the King of England and the King of Canada. I don't, did you know that? Anyways, so a new, a new king, and that takes effect the moment the, the, other, the other monarch passes away, then the new, uh, the new, the, the, the uh, successor, the descendant, the oldest descendant becomes automatically uh, the monarch right there and then. So, then you have the, the Prime Minister of England, which is interesting. Uh, she became Prime Minister two days before. And so she had pledged allegiance to the Queen of England as the Prime Minister of England. And, uh, and then two days later, she's pledging allegiance to King Charles, the ruler of England, the King of Eng- the King, the ruler of the nation, and the defender of the faith. Interesting. Uh, interesting, because the, the king of England is the head of the Church of England, 
national church. Interesting. We don't have it that way in Canada. But it's, it's just some, some interesting thoughts. So a fair bit of faith conversation. Anyways, then, then also, if you're becoming a citizen in Canada, uh, you have to pledge allegiance to the king. Uh, so uh, I'm interested because our son-in-law is an immigrant, and so we're expecting that next year or the year after he'll, uh, after you've been here long enough, uh, I think it's four or five years, then you can apply for citizenship. And then when you become a citizen, you have to pledge allegiance to Canada's king. Uh, or can, and so, so in the afternoon, there's some people scheduled to become citizens and they have to pledge allegiance. And it's, it's switched right now. We pledge allegiance. And so I heard the prime minister of, of England, her name is Liz Truss. I haven't heard that name before because it's just this week, right? So all of these switches. But she swears allegiance. She says, I, Liz Truss, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III, King of Canada, uh, his heirs and successors, so help me God. They have the so help me God thing in there because it's a, he's a defender of the faith and that. So she would have said uh, King of England, we would say King of Canada uh, because he's yeah, King. Anyways, the declaration, I find the declaration interesting there. Uh, swear, I swear allegiance. I proclaim with my, confess with my mouth, King Charles is my king. I, I believe, or it says, I will be faithful and I pledge allegiance. I swear allegiance. I will be faithful in my heart. I will believe in my heart. I will be faithful. And I will declare my allegiance to the king. Wow. And that's exactly what it says in Romans. If we can believe in our heart, if we believe, we are faithful, and we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord, Jesus is my king, then we will be saved. Oh, so the, the parallel was just very interesting to me. And so now I'm wondering what exactly does that mean and what does it look like? So in, in the world, in citizen, and I want, I want to come back, to, uh, I want to be reading Romans 10. We're, get, we're getting there pretty soon, start reading some scripture on this. But I just find, find it interesting. In the world, in countries, there's that positive statement, I will participate as a, as a citizen to help society function in unity under the direction of our sovereign. So you're the king, you say how it's going to be, and I am pledging my allegiance to your, uh, your rule. Okay? In the negative term, I will not undermine the authority of the sovereign and promote chaos. I'm going to follow along. That's the pledge of allegiance. The outcomes is, um, well, every, every civilized country has some sort of governing authority. When there's no governing authority, then it's called anarchy and it's chaos and everybody's doing whatever they want. And uh, so th there's, uh, often they'll say, um, a bad government is better than no government because you'll have complete chaos. So having roads means somebody decided to collect taxes and we all got to put our, we all got to put our tax money in and get that road to drive on, right? So there's, there's certain uh, benefits. Uh, uh, for me, one of the prime examples now we're thinking of just, uh, worldly government. For me, a prime example is in Belize, the, the, the uh, Spanish lookout, the Mennonite colony there. Belize is a third world country and it's, it's, it's a third world country. And it's, um, it's, not, it's not a great place. But then you get to the Mennonite colony and all of a sudden you're, you're back in Canada. You've got paved roads and, and ditches and rows of trees and barns with shiny roofs and, and, and uh, a Wi-Fi network in the whole in the whole community, like it's you're you're right back in in Canada, just just like that. And, and what the difference is, a little bit of organization. You've got you've got a dairy where they make uh, uh, bottle cheese, <laughs> and it's true. Uh, you can ask Corny about that one. Uh, he's been down there to help them set up the cheese factory properly. But they make cheese, they make ice cream, and they and they do all the beef and the dairy and the the poultry. Uh, manufacturing and, and pork, etc. So they have organized to make slaughterhouse so that they can farm on a larger scale. And the prosperity there is interesting. And what it is is citizens getting together, saying, we want this to happen. So we elect a leader who can coordinate, and then we pay taxes appropriately so that we can build that slaughterhouse so that we can market our, our, our animals in the country, etc. right? So it's actually, uh, that, that's the way government's supposed to work. Uh, and, but it works when there's somebody in charge and the citizens participate and give allegiance to the king and follow along. And so I'm wondering, 
what does that mean for the kingdom of God and Christ being Lord and us submitting to him and following him. Uh, so there's a good news proclamation. So in, uh, in England, there's a bad news. The queen has died. Good news, we have a new king. So that's the, the celebration, the proclamation. There's a new king. Good news, there's a new king. And I'm not sure if, if King Charles is really going to make a difference as a new king, uh, but I know that when Christ come, came, he makes a difference as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so that's our focus here. So a few scriptures leading us to this question of our uh, believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, I, I just want to read a few scriptures that set us in our context as citizens of the kingdom of heaven with Christ our Lord. So Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, says, our, citizen, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our lowly con condition into conformity with his glorious body by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He is Lord. All things submit to him because he is Lord and we call him the Lord Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ, the Messiah, God's chosen one. And he is our Lord and we are submitting to him. We are citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Christ Jesus is our Lord and we pledge allegiance. Okay, interesting. Um, when Jesus began his ministry in Mark chapter 1. Um, so uh, uh, the sc scholars think Mark was the first gospel that was written. Matthew makes a stronger connection to the Old Testament, but the scholars uh, think of Mark as the, the first gospel that was written. And it's interesting, when Jesus comes on the scene, you've got John the Baptist, and then when Jesus comes on the scene in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, after John was taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. The gospel of God. So when the first things, the first thing Jesus says in the gospel is the preaching of the gospel of God. And this is the gospel of God. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Here, the gospel, the good news, this is it. The king has come. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's a king. There's a new king in town. A new king in this world. And, uh, and we are to repent and believe in the gospel. Turn from your sinful ways. Give your allegiance to Jesus. The new king in town. So this is the, this is the, the Jesus opening statement in scripture. Uh, for the first thing he, he's recorded as saying, uh, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, so repent and believe the gospel. Believe in the gospel. So now, now turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Uh, Romans chapter 1, the introduction again to the gospel. This is the good news. This is the, the declaration. There's a new king in town. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. So Paul's writing to the Romans, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. Called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This gospel was promised beforehand through, the, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And the gospel is concerning his son. It's con the gospel is about Jesus. Uh, and what do we know about Jesus? He was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, he was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, and we call him Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? So the gospel is all about Jesus. What about Jesus? He was born a descendant of David. He was born the son of David to rule on the throne of David. He's born to be king. Uh, he is, and the second thing you need to know about him is he is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. When he rises from the dead, 
he is authorized, he is enthroned as the king. He, is, um, he, now, he now sits on the throne, he is, he is en endued with the power of God. He's uh, declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He's born to be king, he rises up and sits at the right hand of the throne of God to be the king. He rules, and that's why we call him Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, God's promised uh, Messiah, son of David, ruler of God's people, and uh, he is our Lord. We call him Lord. We bow before him. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the introduction in the book of Romans. And then we come to chapter, chapter 10. Come to chapter 10, I want to read from verse 4 through verse 13. And then ask him a question about what does it mean to confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes of the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who performs them will live by them. But the righteousness based on faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness and with a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the Lord, the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there's a calling again, okay? Okay. Um, so verse 4 tells us that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the goal. Christ is the focus. Christ is our declaration. It's all going to come back to Jesus. Whatever the gospel is, it's all going to come back to Jesus. That's uh, from beginning to end, it's about Jesus. The, the gospel message will focus on Christ. Uh, verse 5 to 8 asks the question, um, how can we attain? Is it attainable? Is it out of our reach? Sometimes, how are we going to get to God? Well, it's too far away. Maybe somebody's going to have to go to heaven to bring a Savior down. Or maybe somebody's going to have to go down to hell to bring a Savior up so that we can be saved. But we're going to put in this great Lord of the Rings kind of effort to try to get close to salvation, to bring salvation close. Uh, is this the situation? And Paul uh, quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30 to say, no. It's not hard. No, you don't have to put in this amazing effort to save yourself. Actually, it's not far away. It's not as far away as you think. Uh, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30 there. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. Um, so the law is given. That's why it's called Deuteronomy, the second law. The law is repeated. Uh, so Moses is preaching. This is how we follow God. And in verse, uh, chapter 30, verse 11, he says, This commandment, which I am commanding you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it far away. Can, can we accomplish the law of God? Can we obey the law of God? Can God ever be satisfied us, with us? Uh, can we reach salvation? It's not too difficult for you, Moses says, and it's not too far away. It's not in heaven that you could say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. Somebody go to heaven and get salvation. Tell us about it so that we can follow it. Uh, it's not that. Nor is it beyond the sea that you, that you could say, who will cross the sea for us and get it for us and proclaim it for, to us so that we may follow it. It's not that. On the contrary, the word is near you. It's not far away that somebody has to go get it. It is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may follow it. You already know it, and it's in your mouth. You just got to say it. 
It's, it's right, it's not hard. So the message uh, that he's reflecting on here in Romans chapter 10 uh, is exactly that message. It's not far away, it's not a lot of work that you have to do for salvation. It's actually closer than you think. It's, it's not even out there that you have to drive to Winnipeg to go to Costco to go pick it up or something. It's actually right here. It's in the building. It's actually in your heart. It's in your mouth. You, you know it. You just got to say it. It's right there. This is the gospel. Uh, this is your salvation is right close at hand. And so, so, what's in, and so then we would ask, so what is it that's in my heart? What is it that's in my mouth that we need to uh, believe and confess? And so in verse 9, he, uh, verse 8, verse eight to, te- uh, to 10, he lays it out very clearly. What does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And that is the word of faith that we are preaching. Here it is, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not hard. It's not far away. It's right here, and it's right here. Because with a heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with a mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Uh, So, what is it that we are supposed to confess? We are supposed to confess that Jesus is Lord. What is it that we're supposed to believe in our heart? We're supposed to believe that God raised him from the dead. And if God raised him from the dead, uh, the book of Hebrews goes long to explain that when Christ rose from the dead, he had defeated the enemies. And when he rises from the dead, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God and all enemies have been defeated and he is reigning at the right hand of the throne of God in glory. He is king. For eternity, he is king. Uh, when Jesus was arrested, they brought him before Pilate. And Pilate is the king in the area of Israel. And the accusation against Jesus, they say, you're the king of the Jews. Is it true? And he says, yeah, I am the king, but my kingdom is not of this world. I'm, I'm more king than you know. But yes, he's the king. Jesus is the king. He's the king of, of heaven and earth. And so this is this, uh, this declaration. Uh, we, we declare Jesus to be Lord. We believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and seated him on the throne. And so we, uh, so we pledge allegiance. So, uh, yes, it's attainable. Uh, can we reach it? Yes, we can reach it. Uh, what's interesting to me, though, is I've always understood and believed, of course, you believe in your heart, and you, you believe in your heart and you're saved. And here it's telling me you believe in your heart, but you also need to confess with your mouth. And I, I don't know, as a, as a men and I do, we're not supposed to talk a lot. <laughs> How do, what do we do with that? And so it seems to me that this passage is telling me I need to be more vocal about declaring Jesus is Lord. And maybe I need to be more deliberate in my heart as well uh, to pledge allegiance to the Lord. I'll follow you wherever you lead me. And that means uh, when I pledge allegiance here, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to turn my back on someone else. That's repent. That's turn. Turn away from whatever you're following and pledge allegiance to follow Jesus. Declare that Jesus is my Lord. I will be following him. I found it interesting the, in, in Canada Parliament, uh, uh, Trudeau and the, uh, the governor general or someone came out the back door and they stood there and they pledged exactly this pledge of allegiance. I, I we promise to be faithful, and we pledge our allegiance to King Charles III of England, so help me God. So they make this declaration, and then they did it again in French, and I'm not sure what to do with that. Because I'm pledging allegiance to the King of England, and then I do it in French. But hang on, are we pledging allegiance to England or to France? And it was just kind of seemed interesting to me, but where's this, where's this deliberate statement that we will follow, the, the King of England is our is our guide. And I, th- and I think in, in politics, obviously it's more of a symbol, a lot of symbol and not a lot of reality. And that's something that we're, we're aware of. Uh, but when it comes to following Jesus, are we willing to repent, to turn away from whoever else it was that we were following and to follow Jesus directly? And are we willing to say it out loud? And th- so here's the thing, you can, you can believe it in your heart, but if you don't tell anyone, then you can then the next time you're in a conversation, you can believe in your heart another thing. But it's when you say it out loud, I'm taking my stand here, 
then you have turned your back. Well, then, then you're, so you're, uh, you're dating two girls. <laughs> Don't do that. It's not, not advised. <laughs> but at some point, you're gonna be, before you get married, you're going to have to make a choice. And when you say, I'm going to marry this girl, that means you're turning your back on the other one. When you open your mouth and say, I do, out loud, then this relationship's over and you've made a decision. That's the difference. So you can, um, you can have affection for both of these people, but when you get married, you're going to have to repent and believe and proclaim. You're going to have to uh, close one door in order to walk through the other. And I think that's uh, maybe a good illustration about this confession thing. Putting your, your, putting your mouth where your heart is, putting your money where your mouth is, okay? Uh, so, yeah, believing that Christ reigns and, that we, and declaring that we will follow him. Uh, so, um, at least I take away from this that I need to be more vocal about my allegiance to Jesus that I need to be willing to say out loud, Jesus is my Lord, and this is not. And so um, I think that's what, um, what baptism signifies. Well, it's, why baptism? Why this public declaration? Why not just believe in your heart and then see how it goes? But the scripture is very clear, believe and be baptized. Uh, there too, make that declaration. If you believe it in your heart, then say it out loud. Get in the water. I invite your friends to your baptism service and let them all know from here forward, I pledge allegiance to Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus wherever he leads me, and I'm turning my back on the sin that we used to do together. Here's a change in my world. It was that for me. It was, that, okay, this is, where, this is where I put my anchor down. From here on, I'm following Jesus wherever he leads me, and that means an end to other uh, activities and other directions and other lords. Um, to put, conf- uh, believing in your heart and then confessing out loud that Jesus is my Lord. We're actively saying that other kings are not my Lord. And if you don't say it out loud, then you can keep flipping back and forth. So in Jesus' day, it was Jesus or it was Caesar, right? When you pledge allegiance to Jesus, when you said, I'm following Jesus as my king, when you say Jesus Christ is the Lord, you're saying Caesar is not. Okay? In, uh, in, in what, what are, who are the other lords that we need to turn our back on in our world? In, this, in the States, it's, I find it interesting, we were down at concert there and they I will worship only at the feet of Jesus and the next song is I will worship America and everybody stands up takes off their hats crosses their heart and all of a sudden they're they're doing they're turning their back on on the world and I'll worship only at the feet of Jesus and then the next song they turn around and they take off their hats and they stand at attention and pledge allegiance uh, to the flag of America and and to me it was just uh, I'm standing there as a Canadian that doesn't understand these things I'm wondering Okay, uh, who's in charge here? Who's in charge here and who will we bow to ultimately? And ultimately what happens, what happens is when, uh, when the American military needs us in Iraq, then we bow and we run and we follow directions. And when Jesus says, love your enemy, then we, then we, we're in a battle. And Christ is asking for allegiance. Will we actually take a stand? So in, in, um, in Canada, we're not patriotic in the same way. Um, so I wonder for us, what are, what are the, the other gods that, or the other idols that call us for allegiance? And maybe it's career, maybe it's success, maybe it's money, maybe it's co- our comfort. Maybe it's these other things, I'll follow Jesus, but not if it costs me this. What am I willing to turn my back on and say, Jesus is Lord, and I'll follow you regardless? Am I willing to say, it, Jesus is Lord, and it's going to affect the way I do all of these other things in my life? Because Jesus is Lord. Um, what are we willing to give up, sacrifice, to pay? What the price are we willing to pay to say Jesus is Lord? Because when you say Jesus is Lord, it's going to cost you something on the other side. Are we willing to say it? So, um, application. When, when does this hit the, when, when does the rubber meet the road here? Uh, so, at a funeral, uh, and so I've been at a few funerals and a, a number of times I've been asked, hey preacher, did grandpa ever tell you he was saved? Did grandpa ever talk about Jesus out loud? You've heard that question, right? And I'm thinking, uh, and so I've had, I've, when, when I've visited people in hospitals, I've had spiritual conversations that may, that grandchildren may not have had with grandpa. 
because I'm a preacher, so I have spiritual conversations, and it's, it's kind of expected, so I'll have some of those conversations. So I got grandchildren asking, did Grandpa ever say that he was saved? Because that, right now, he, he's passed away, and nothing else matters. That's the only thing I need to know. And, so, uh, and, I, and I'm often disappointed. You mean your Grandpa never told you? And I may or may not have had the conversation, but I'm disappointed that Grandpa never told you. And you, uh, so Grandpa could have set his family at ease and let them know, Jesus is my Lord, and he was risen from the dead, and I will be too. And I want you to know that, and that's one question that you don't need to ask when I pass away. That would be, that would be polite to your grandchildren. It would be polite to the preacher that he doesn't have to answer the question after the fact. And it would be good for your own faith. So that you could, because we live with certain doubts. Do I, do I actually believe? Do I believe enough to say it out loud? Do I believe in my heart enough to confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord? Um, it would be good for our own, for our own um, faith to say it out loud. And, and I think uh, Scripture has given us this direction here. Believe in your heart, also confess with your mouth, and you will be saved. And so I, I don't know, that, that funeral question haunts me sometimes. I want my children to know that I think Jesus is Lord, and that, and that, I, and that I'm following him as Lord, and I'm willing to confess that. So uh, I want to read one more scripture here uh, in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is the turning point in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, you've got, yet everybody loves Jesus up till Matthew chapter 16 because he's feeding the hungry, he's uh, raising the dead, he's, he's healing the sick, uh, he's, uh, he's preaching the gospel, he's blessing the children, uh, and people are coming around to listen to him teach, and they're bringing their sick to be healed, and everybody loves Jesus up to chapter 16. Chapter 16, Peter confesses Christ as Lord, and then they try to kill him. From there on, uh, the Pharisees and the religious leaders are uh, chasing Jesus down to kill him, and ultimately they, they will. So uh, then that changes at chapter 16, and it changes when Peter confesses Christ as Lord. So uh, Matthew, this is significance of the confession. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, uh, others Elijah, or still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Confess with your mouth. I want to hear it. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So, so there's, a, there's a whole sermon. There's a lot of stuff going on in that passage. A lot of declaration. Uh, Peter makes a de declaration, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus makes a declaration uh, about Peter and about the kingdom and about judgment, etc. So there's a lot of things going on there. But it is significant to me that, first of all, everything changes here in Jesus' ministry. The gospel story adjusts here around the confession. And once the disciples were ready to make the confession out loud, then Jesus says, now we can get on with this. And on that confession, or on Peter's confession, I'll build the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. It's kingdom, it's kingdom language all the way through. You've, you've confessed out loud Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and you've, you're, you've given the keys to the kingdom. This, and the, the, that, it comes together there in a very significant way. And so I'm, I'm just 
interested. Uh, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the keys of the kingdom are handed over, and we're in, we're in, uh, we're in this kingdom battle. Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord, and we have declared it, and now uh, the, that ministry, the ministry of the church begins, and the building of the church begins. So, the confession. We're called to confession. Peter was called to confession. Peter confessed. Are we, will, are we willing and ready to confess with our mouth what we believe in our hearts? Uh, so, in conclusion, let me ask just a few questions here. Uh, or, or some direction and encouragement. Uh, first of all, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and that he is seated at the right hand of God, ruling from the throne of heaven, and that he is king. Believe it in your heart that, Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, second, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. If you believe it in your heart, say it with your mouth. Uh, is that hard? It, it sounds simple enough when you say it, but then all of a sudden you're in a restaurant and, and you're wondering, am I going to pray? And you've got your grandchildren there and at home you pray out loud and the, now the kids are wondering, what, what's grandpa doing bowing his head and saying nothing? When's he going to start praying, right? When you're in a restaurant, do you pray out loud and say, hey Jesus, you're Lord and we're thankful for the food on the table. You've been good to us. Do we do that? Do we, or do, do we find it awkward to say Jesus out loud? Maybe that's one place you test that. Are we willing to say Jesus is Lord when others are going to hear it? Okay? Um, don't make the people around you wonder. Uh, take away your own doubts of faith. Proclaim Jesus out loud. Um, if you believe it in your heart, proclaim it with your mouth. Uh, scripture says that's how you will be saved. And interesting. Something that I didn't expect to see. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth and you will be saved. And so, uh, the other question. Does our expressed faith in Jesus, does it shape the way we live in his kingdom day to day? So, we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth. Do we live it out? Does the way we live demonstrate that Jesus is Lord in my life? That's the, that other question. Do the things that we do today, uh, does it... Does it make the way of the kingdom of God work or does it frustrate the reign of God in my world? If, am I, if I say Christ is my Lord, do I follow him in such a way to help make his kingdom work? That's, that's that other question. Do I believe in my heart? Do I confess Jesus is Lord with my mouth? And do I, do I live like Jesus is my Lord? And that's, those are questions that all of us can ask and take home with us. Let's bow for prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, thank you that you raised Christ Jesus from the dead uh, to give us victory over sin and death and to give us a hope of resurrection and eternity and to be our Lord, to give us guidance in this life we live. Uh, dear God, thank you for all of these things. Lord, uh, we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, we haven't as often proclaimed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And for me, that's, that's asked me, that's caused me to measure a little bit. And, and maybe all of us are measuring in our hearts a little bit. Uh, is it really that important that we confess with our mouth? And am I really willing to confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart? So dear God, uh, I pray your gentle conviction on each one of us that you would draw us a step closer in confidence to proclaim Jesus as Lord. Lord, the world is in chaos, so much confusion, because people are following so many different idols in this world. There's great confusion out there. There's so much need. The, the Jesus who is King of kings and Lord of lords and to whom we will all answer to one day. And so I pray that we would be faithful in proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, and encouraging others to submit to him because they'll answer to him one day. So I pray that you would uh, convict us according to your spirit, by your spirit in our hearts, convict us to, uh, to believe and to confess that Jesus is Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Lord, this is good. Uh, the benediction from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory 
blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. That the king language and the, the, the majesty and the glory and the dominion and authority, uh, very interesting. That's our Lord. Amen. Okay, sorry, man. In, uh, in closing, I'll read in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the, the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And then verse 23, Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. We are dismissed.